We want to move on now to consider the Green's function for the canonical or classic Sturm-Louisville problem that shows up everywhere in the mathematical physics and the engineering sciences. And so what we want to think about is how do we think about constructing that Green's function? What does it look like? Uh, in fact, there's a, there a very nice representation of the Green's function for Sturm-Louisville problems. I'm going to derive it right here because a lot of the, f uh, you know, classic problems that we consider out of electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, elasticity, have a Sturm-Louisville form. So we want to exploit that fact to write down representative solutions. So I want to remind you that the Green's function, what we're trying to solve is L u good f. And what we do is we posit a second problem, which is the Green's function solution, which satisfies L dagger g, the adjoint problem, equals to a delta function. So what we do is we take the L u equal to f, <coughs> we take the operator L, we construct, construct its adjoint, and then if we think about the adjoint problem being forced by the delta function, that is what the Green's function satisfies. And what we showed last time is we can basically take the inner product with L equal to F with respect to G, and you, then you can write down your solution, which is just basically it's going to be the integral of F against G, and that's going to be the solution U. Okay? So the question is, let's, let's talk about that L operator. That's for a non-self-adjoint case or a generic case, but when we talk about sturm level operators, the L operator takes a very specific form, and here it is here. We've already talked about this in terms of eigenfunction expansions. And here, again, I'm just re-representing it, where P, Q are both positive functions on the interval of interest. Um, and we want to we take a look at what are we going to do with this, op this specific operator and its specific boundary condition. The sturm level operator is self-adjoint, which means the Green's function is going to have the same boundary conditions and the same operator. So if we look at the Green's function, if it's self-adjoint, it's going to be exactly the same problem, but instead of an f of x over there, the forcing is going to be a delta function. So this is it. So here is the Green's function problem for sturm level operator. So here's the operator, sturm level operator, forced by delta, boundary conditions. Okay, so I want to solve this. And remember, one of the things that helps us in solving this, what we used before as our technique, was this delta function, this forcing on the right, is zero everywhere except at x, e x equal to c. So essentially, it means solving a homogeneous problem to the left and to the right. In other words, this operator Lg is equal to zero on the left of x equal to c and on the right of x equal to c. Okay? And then the one solution on the left inherits this boundary condition. The one on the right inherits that boundary condition. So let's talk about, though, what happens at x equal to c. So first of all, we're going to enforce continuity. So what forcing continuity means is if we take the jump in the function, this is what the bars, the, sort of the brackets represent, take g at c, what's the jump there? It's zero. I want it to be continuous. So in other words, the Green's function, just to the right and just to the left, this jump has to be zero. So this is going to be, we're going to enforce continuity of the Green's function. There is no jump. It's a continuous function. Okay? What about the derivative? The derivative, we go back to the original uh, equation for the Green's function, and here it is, but now I'm going to integrate it. So basically, this is the operator L, but now I'm integrating it across where x is equal to c. So from c minus to c plus, just across that jump, and over here, I integrate the right-hand side, which is the delta function. And what we know, if you integrate the delta function cross C, the impulse is 1. So this on the right is going to be 1. And then the question is, what about the rest of this here? Well, if we integrate this, notice that I have P of x, G of x derivative. So integrating this is easy. I just undo that derivative. And I evaluate this now, this quantity P of x, G of x, across this jump x equal to c. And then I look at the second term here. I integrate this. But q of x and g are both continuous. So this is going to be 0. There is no jump there. It's continuous. And so what you end up with is just p of x, g of x is equal to minus 1. In other words, what we've just calculated 
is the jump in the derivative that happens at x equals c. So here it is. This is the generic representation of this jump. You take the function p of x, it exists in your linear operator, and it's one, one, minus 1 over p evaluated at c. That is the jump in the derivative uh, for the Green's function. Okay? So we have continuity, and now I have a condition on the jump in the derivative. And there it is. And it's related to the p of x in the stern lowval operator evaluated at x equals c. Okay, so let's go solve this. And what I mean by solve this is we're going to give an arbitrary kind of a generic representation of what the solution might look like. The stern lowval operator is a second order operator. So if I go and solve it to the left, in other words, x less than the c, so left of the delta function, I have some solution, let's call it y1 of x. And it's a second order operator, and once I pin down the boundary conditions, I'm left with one uh, arbitrary constant. And we saw this before when we were solving some of our problems in the last lecture, which is you have this arbitrary constant times the solution y1. And on the right side, same kind of thing happens. If you solve the homogeneous equation, satisfy the boundary conditions, you're left with one arbitrary constant and a solution, which we're going to just call generically y2. So in other words, I have a solution y1 on the left, solution y2 on the right. They each have an arbitrary constant. And I'm going to determine those arbitrary constants by satisfying continuity of the Green's function and satisfying the jump condition of the derivative of the Green's function. So once I have these, I can start imposing the interface conditions. So here it is. I have the jump in the Green's function, which is 0. I have the jump in the derivative, which is minus 1 over p. I'm going to impose those. So I have two conditions to impose, but I actually have two unknowns as well. So two, equa two equations, two unknowns. That's going to allow me to come back and solve for the a and a b here. Okay? Now if you do that and actually go and impose those conditions here, what you find is you can actually compute the Green's function. And here's how it comes out. The Green's function, uh, this is just a bit of algebra, but the Green's function is given by the solution y1 at x, y2 at c, divided by p of c and the Ronskian of the solutions between y1 and y2. Okay, so you get this Ronskian structure, which is non-zero because they're linearly independent solutions. And y1 of c, y2 of x divided by, again, the Ronskian times p, evaluated at c. So I have this nice representation of the Green's function, and notice that how it has symmetry in it, right? If I switch the x and the c variables here, they look, this becomes this, this becomes that, okay? So this is the generic representation of the Green's function for sturm lerville problems. So it's very nice. You, you're exploiting the fact that you have self-adjointness and you can compute this very easily. And so now, instead of going in, you just, if you can write down a solution on the left and the right, you can just plug it in here and you can compute out what your solution, what your Green's function should look like. So let's do an example of a Green's function. And here's the example I want to do. This is actually comes from uh, you know, some kind of radially symmetric uh, physics. So it's, you notice this is your, your operator in radial coordinates. So it's DDR, RDR, DGDR equals to a delta function. So I'm going to think about basically constructing the Green's function for this uh, with the boundary conditions that at some distance l, the solution is 0. So at r equals l is g equals 0. And at the origin, the solution is finite. Okay? So my job now is to figure out is how do I solve this equation. Now, if I look at the homogeneous case, in other words, set this to 0 on the right-hand side. In other words, right now the delta function is acting at some rho location rho. <coughs> but to the left and right of rho, it's just equal, this is equal to 0. So what are the homogeneous solutions to this? Well, this has two homogeneous solutions, a constant and log r. Of course, you can put arbitrary constants in front of these things. So it could be a and b at log r. But really, you're looking for a y1 and a y2. 
Now it turns out uh, for the solution, if you want this thing to be finite at r equals zero, you're going to have to, you know, on the left, then the only solution available to you is the constant. And then if you want the solution to be zero at some finite difference, at some finite distance, then you're going to use this log r solution here. Okay, so on one side you have the constant, on the other side you have the log. <coughs> and if you put these in, you can basically have your y1 and y2 variables. You can compute the Ronskian and the p. <coughs> p times the Ronskian is 1. So what you end up with then is a very simple representation of the Green's function solution, which is given by here. The Green's function of r comma rho, and rho now is acting like arc c. It's the position in which the delta function is acting, is given by this here, log rho over l, or log r over l, for r less than rho, r greater than rho. So this gives us a very nice representation of the Green's function solution, which we can then, if we force this uh, system, we can construct solutions arbitrarily by just integrating against this g. <coughs> Let's do one more example with this Green's function. So here it is. Here's, a, here's an example, uxx plus 2u minus x. And I want to get the solution to this uh, with the following boundary conditions. And by the way, we did this before with an eigenfunction expansion. And now we're going to look at what this looks like from the point of view of a Green's function solution. Okay? So there are your boundary conditions. All right? And so <coughs> what we're going to do is consider the Green's function for this. So here's the Green's function. So we're going to, this is in sturm louisville form, so it's self-adjoint. So I'm going to go ahead and write down, here's what the Green's function satisfies, but now instead of the right-hand side being some function f of x, it's the delta function. And you can actually go and compute solutions to this. They're not that hard to do. They take on the form of sine square root 2x. This is, I mean, just set set that equal to zero, you see that, you know, there's, you can get sine square root 2x on one side, and then if you satisfy the boundary condition on the other side, here's what the y2 looks like on the other side. So it's a little bit more work because, in fact, that boundary condition is this one here. It's, it's u1 plus the derivative of x u1 at 1 is equal to zero. So it's a little bit more complicated to satisfy, but you know, you could still write down your solution. Here's y1, here's y2. This satisfies the left boundary condition. This satisfies the right boundary condition. And notice what I've done here. I've put the argument as x minus 1. I know that the boundary condition is at 1, so I've centered these functions over at 1 to make my algebra calculations simpler to do. So there's y1, y2. And then the only thing I would need to do is compute the Ronskin between them and that allows me to construct the Green's function. And there it is. There's the Green's function that we have with this thing. So it's, it's a little bit more comp complicated looking, but it is still symmetric with x and the c. And now with this Green's function, I can now integrate it with that forcing x to get the solution out. So here you go. u of x, this is the Green's function solution. Take your f of x, integrate it with against the g, and so this was just x, or in integral form, it's going to, because it's the dummy variable c here, it's going to be c. You, you can integrate that thing out, and this is your result after quite a bit of algebra. What you find is this, this here. This is your expression. And by the way, you can compare this to your eigenfunction expansion solution, which was quite, quite a bit more complicated. Even though there was quite a bit of work to get this integral worked out, it actually gives you a very nice close form solution that's not that complex to, to, to work with and evaluate. So this is one of the, the really nice things. You've basically found the inverse operator, and so you just hit it with that x, and you found your solution here, which is uh, a fantastic way to kind of pull out solutions using this Green's function technique. And again, the, the key here is with the sturm louisville form, once you have a solution on the left and the right, this y1 and y2, <coughs> then all you have to do is compute the Ronsky in between them. And you know what p is, so your solution is pretty easy to represent in this generic sturm louisville form, which is y1 x, y2 xc, divided by p xc, w xc, and then switch the x and the xc for the right-hand side of the function. 
And that's it. And that is Green's functions for Sturm-Louisville.